The celebrated historian, Lord Acton, in a letter to a friend of his, said about Jean-Jacques Rousseau that he produced more effect with his pen than Aristotle or Cicero or St. Augustine or St. Thomas Aquinas or any other man who ever lived. And this observation, although obviously exaggerated, nevertheless conveys something which is not totally untrue. Against this may be cited the remark of Madame de Stahl, <coughs> who said, Rousseau said nothing new, but set everything on fire. What constitutes the greatness of Rousseau? Why is he regarded as an important thinker? What did he say? Did he make any new or original discovery? Did he really say nothing new? Is Madame de Stahl right? And if he didn't, how was it that such a remark as Lord Acton's could be applied to him at all? Some say it is only his wonderful eloquence, his hypnotic style. For example, the style of the Confessions, which is a book very difficult for anyone to put down, a book which has had more effect, I think, upon readers than almost any similar work of art that was ever produced. But then, was it really nothing new in what Rousseau said? Was it really simply old wine in new bottles? Some say it was because previous thinkers addressed themselves to reason, whereas Rousseau addressed himself to sentiment. But that's scarcely true. There's plenty about sentiment in Diderot and Helvetius, in Shaftesbury and Reynald. They're always saying that so far from suppressing men's feelings, as the austerer religions always demanded, and philosophers like Plato and Spinoza also, man must not curb or maim his spontaneous nature. Certainly the emotions have to be canalized or guided, but they must not be suppressed. On the contrary, more than any other thinkers who ever lived the school of rational rationalists, so-called rationalist thinkers, in the 18th century stressed the value of feeling, stressed the value of human spontaneity and warmth. No writer is more passionate and indeed more sentimental in that subject than, for example, Diderot. Whereas, if we look at Rousseau's writings, to all appearance, the opposite is the case. Rousseau is not at all in favor of sentiment. On the contrary, he says, and he has a great philosophical tradition behind him, that sentiments divide people, whereas reason unites them. Sentiments, feelings, are subjective, individual, vary from person to person, country to country, climb to climb, whereas reason is one in all men. There are certain questions about morals and about politics, how to live, what to do, whom to obey, to which many conflicting answers have been given by the accumulation of human feelings, prejudices, superstitions, odd causal natural factors which have made men say now this, now that. But if we are to get the answer, if we are to obtain the true answer to this question, then this is not the way to do it. We must ask the question in such terms as make it answerable. And that can only be done by means of reason. Just as in the sciences, a true answer given by one scientist will be accepted by all other scientists, equally reasonable, so in ethics and politics. The rational answer is the correct answer. The truth is one, and, there are, and error is multiple. This is all perfectly commonplace. Few philosophers have failed to say something of the kind, and Rousseau simply repeats his predecessors in saying that it is reason which is the same in all men and unites emotions which are different and divide. What then was it that was so very original? His name is, of course, associated with the social contract, but there's nothing new in that. The notion that men in society, in order to preserve themselves, have had historically to enter some kind of compact, or if not historically, at any rate behave, as if they had done so, that men in society, because some are stronger than others, or more malevolent than others, have had to set up institutions whereby the weak majority is able to prevent the strong minority from riding roughshod over them, that is an idea certainly as old as the Greeks. What then is it that Rousseau added to this idea? Well, some might say he effected a reconciliation between individual liberty and the authority of the community. But then this was the question which had been discussed times out of number by his predecessors. Indeed, the whole 
the central question which occupied thinkers like Machiavelli and Baudin, Hobbes and Locke, was this very question. Nothing is more familiar or more natural in the history of political thought than the question how men's desire for liberty can be reconciled with the necessity for authority. It is clear to all political thinkers that individuals desire to be free. That is to say, they desire to do what they want to do without being prevented from doing it by other people or coerced into doing something they don't want to do. And that this is one of the chief ends or values for the sake of which people are prepared to fight and which um, one of the values um, which is necessary uh, for the purpose of leading the kind of life which above all they wish to lead. On the other hand, of course, um, there is uh, the necessity for organized existence. Men live in society for whatever reason, and because men live in society, individuals cannot be allowed to do whatever they like, because this may get in the way of other people and frustrate their ends. Therefore, some kind of arrangement has to be made. Well, if among past thinkers, this very central problem led to various answers. It led to answers which varied to some extent in accordance with the view of the individual taken by these various thinkers. Hobbes, who took a rather low view of human nature and thought that man on the whole was bad rather than good, thought that a great deal of authority was necessary in order to curb the naturally wild, unruly and bestial impulses of man and therefore um, drew the frontier between authority and liberty in favor of authority. He thought a great deal of coercion was needed to prevent human beings from um, destroying each other, from ruining each other's lives, from creating conditions in which life would be nasty, brutish, and short for the vast majority of society. And therefore, he uh, left the area for liberty somewhat small. Locke, on the other hand, who thought on the whole that men were more good than bad, thought it wasn't necessary to draw the frontier quite so far in favor of authority, and thought that it was possible to create a society in which those rights, which according to him, men possessed while they were in a state of nature, were still, to, to some extent, some of these rights, that is, retained by men even in civil society, and allowed men a good many more individual rights than Hobbes did on the ground that they were more benevolent by nature and that it wasn't necessary to crush them, coerce them and restrain them to quite the severe degree demanded by Hobbes in order to create that minimum of security in which alone society can survive. But the point I wish to make is that the arguments between them is simply the argument of where the frontier is to be drawn and the frontier is a shifting one. In the Middle Ages when political thought was largely theological, this took the form of uh, disagreement about whether original sin, which made man wild, wicked, savage, and unruly, was something stronger in him than natural reason or God-given reason, which made him seek after good and proper ends, implanted in him by God. In m more secular ages, when these concepts became insensibly translated into secular terms, uh, the same argument occurred with regard to where the frontier was to be drawn. And the question was, how much liberty, how much authority? How much coercion, how much individual freedom? And you simply arrived at the solution in accordance with what seemed to you to be the uh, truth about human nature and perhaps such scientific data as the influence of climate, of environment, and other factors which a thinker like Montesquieu, for example, takes into such great consideration. Now, the original aspect of Rousseau's teaching is that this will not do for him at all. His notion of liberty and his notion of authority are very different from those of previous thinkers. And although he uses the same words, he puts into them a very different content. And this, indeed, may be one of the great secrets of his eloquence and of his immense effectiveness namely that while he appears to be saying things not very different from his predecessors using the same words and apparently the same concepts yet he alters the meanings of the words he twists the concepts in such a fashion that they produce electrifying effect upon the reader who is insensibly drawn by the familiar expressions into wholly unfamiliar country. Rousseau says one thing and conveys another 
He appears to be arguing along old-fashioned lines, but the vision which he projects before the reader is something totally unlike the kind of schema which he appears to borrow from his predecessors. Let us take, for example, such central concepts in his teaching as the notion of liberty, the notion of contract, the notion of nature. Liberty. For Rousseau, the whole idea of compromising liberty, of saying, well, now we can't have total liberty because that'll lead to anarchy and chaos. We can't have complete authority because that'll lead to the total crushing of individuals, despotism and tyranny. Therefore, we must draw the line somewhere between, arrange a kind of compromise. This is totally unacceptable. Liberty for him is an absolute value. He looks on liberty as if it were a kind of religious concept. For him, liberty is really identical with the human being himself. To say that a man is a man and to say that he is free are almost the same. What is a man for Rousseau? A man is somebody responsible for his acts, capable of doing good and evil, capable of following the path either of the right or of the wrong. If he is not free, this becomes meaningless. If a man is not free, if a man is not responsible for what he does, if a man doesn't do what he does because he wants to do it, because this is his personal human goal, because in this way he achieves something which he and not somebody else at this moment desires. If he doesn't do that, he's not a human being at all. He has no accountability. The whole notion of moral responsibility, which for Rousseau is the essence of man almost more than his reason, depends upon the fact that a man can choose, choose between alternatives, choose between them freely, be uncoerced. If a man is coerced, coerced by somebody else, by a tyrant, or even by material circumstances, then it is absurd to say that he chooses, and for Rousseau, he becomes a thing, a chattel, an object in nature, something from which no accountability can be expected. Tables and chairs, and even animals, cannot be regarded as doing right and wrong, for they know not what they do. And they do not know what they do because they don't do, because they don't act. Action is choosing. Choosing implies selection between alternative goals. Someone who cannot choose between alternative goals because he is compelled, either because he is an object determined in nature, as the physicists have taught, simply a bundle of nerves and blood and bone, simply a collection of atoms, just as much under the sway of material laws as the inanimate objects of nature, either because of that, or alternatively, if he is determined not as things are determined in nature, but because he is bullied or coerced by a tyrant, because he is made the creature of somebody who plays upon his fears or his hopes, somebody who in some way manipulates him as one manipulates a puppet, someone like that is not capable of freedom, not capable of action, and is therefore not a human being. There's no saying, but what? A man in this condition, for Rousseau, a slave, might not be happy. But happiness is not the goal. The goal is to live the right kind of life. And therefore, for Rousseau, the proposition that it may be that slaves are often happier than free men doesn't justify slavery. And for this reason, he rejects the utilitarianism of people like Helvetius. Let me quote. He says, slavery is against nature. He says that the unanimity of servitude is quite different from the unanimity of a genuine assembly of men. To renounce liberty, says Rousseau, is to renounce being a man, to surrender the rights of humanity and even its duties. Such a renunciation is not compatible with man's nature. Now, that means that for a man to lose his liberty is to cease to be a man. And that is why a man cannot sell himself into slavery. For once he becomes a slave, he is no longer a man and therefore has no rights, no duties, and a man cannot cancel out himself. He cannot commit an act, the consequence of which is that he can commit no more acts. It's exactly like moral suicide. And suicide is not a human activity. Death is not event, an event in life. Liberty, therefore, for Rousseau, is not something which can be adjusted or compromised. You aren't allowed to give away a little bit of it, or much of it. You aren't allowed to barter so much freedom for so much security, so much freedom for so much happiness. That is exactly like dying a little, dehumanizing yourself a little. And the thing which is very passionately held by Rousseau, one of the values upon which he really spent more eloquence than almost upon any other, is this notion of human integrity. The fact that the ultimate crime, the one sin not to be born, is dehumanization of man, degradation of man, exploitation of man. 
he spends a great deal of his passionate rhetoric on denouncing those who use other people for their own selfish purposes. Not because they make the people whom they use unhappy, as because in some way they dehumanize them. In some way they make them lose their human semblance. And that is, for him, the sin against the Holy Ghost. In short, freedom for Rousseau is an absolute value. And to say of a value that it is absolute is to say that one can't compromise it at all. Now, so far so good, we now have an attitude towards man which makes of liberty the most sacred of his attributes, indeed not an attribute at all, but the essence of what being a man is. But on the, there are other values too. It is impossible simply to declare that freedom, individual freedom, the permission to men to do what they like, a situation in which anybody does anything, is the ideal condition of man, and that for two reasons. First of all, there is the empirical reason. For one reason or another, for one cause or another, men live in societies. Why this happens, Rousseau never quite clearly explains. Possibly because of the inequality of gifts which made some men stronger than others and enabled them to assert their power over others and so enslave them. Perhaps because of some inevitable law of evolution. Perhaps because of a nat natural instinct of sociableness which drives people um, to live together. Perhaps for the reasons which the encyclopedia stated, division of labor for the purpose of leading a life which satisfies more of men's wishes than the isolated life of savages um, would satisfy. Sometimes Rousseau talks about the savage as if he was happy, innocent, and good. At other times, as if he was merely simple and barbarous. But be that as it may, men do live in society. And since they live in society, they have to create rules whereby human beings must so conduct themselves as not to get in each other's way too much, not frustrate each other, not employ their power in such a way as to abort too many of each other's purposes and ends. And therefore there is simply the empirical problem, how is a human being to remain absolutely free, for if he's not free he's not human, and yet not do everything that he wants for what is freedom if it isn't doing what I want, and not being stopped from doing it. There is also a further and a deeper reason for Rousseau. He was, after all, a citizen of Geneva and deeply affected by its Calvinist tradition. And therefore, for Rousseau, there is an ever-present vision of the rules of life. He is deeply concerned about right and wrong, about justice and injustice. There are certain ways of living which are right and certain ways of living which are wrong. In common with the rest of the 18th century, he believes that the question, how should I live, is a real question and has a real answer like any other factual question. And therefore, however we may come by it, by reason or by some other route, there is some answer to the question, how ought I to live? Now, given that we, I have obtained this answer, or think I have obtained it, then there is a rule of life which says, do thus, do not do thus. This is wrong, this is right. This is just, this is unjust, this is good, this is bad, this is handsome, this is ugly. But once we have rules, once we have laws, once we have some kind of regulations which prescribe human life, what is to happen to liberty? How can liberty be compatible with regulations which, after all, hem man in, prevent him from doing anything he wants, tell him what to do and what not to do, forbid him to do certain things, control him to a certain degree? And Rousseau is very passionate about this. He says, that these laws, these rules of life, are not conventions. They are not utilitarian devices invented by man simply for the purpose of achieving some short-term end. No, not at all. Let me quote from him again. They are graven not on tablets of marble or brass, but on the heart of the citizen. And again, the laws of nature, the sacred imprescriptible law, which speaks to the heart of man and to his reason. And again, he says, the power of willing or of choosing, which is, of course, choosing the right path in this case, is not explicable by any mechanical laws. It is something inherent in man, and the laws which he obeys are something which is absolute from which he must not depart. In this respect, Rousseau is, as it were, a secular version of Calvinism. The one thing which he perpetually insists upon is that laws are not conventions, are not conveniences, but simply the drawing up in terms suitable to the time and the place and the people of 
regulations embodying sacred truths, sacred rules which are not man-made but absolute. And so we have a paradox. We have two absolute values, the absolute value of freedom and the absolute value of rules. And we are not allowed to compromise between them. We are not, not allowed to do what Hobbes said might be done, namely, so much freedom, so much authority, so much control, so much individual initiative. Neither of these values may be derogated from. To derogate from freedom is to kill man's immortal soul. To derogate from the rules is to do something absolutely wrong, absolutely bad, absolutely wicked, to fly against the source of the rules, which is sometimes called nature, sometimes conscience, sometimes God, but which in any case is absolute. And this is the dreadful dilemma in which he is plunged. And it's different from the dilemma of those previous thinkers who thought that in some sense adjustment, compromise, empirical devices can produce a solution which is neither wholly good nor wholly bad, but adequate, something enabling human beings to carry on in a moderately convenient fashion, simply based upon common sense and respect, moderate respect, decent respect, due respect, for most of each other's desires, so that people on the whole get uh, not everything they want, but more than they would get under some other system. That for Rousseau is unacceptable. An absolute value means that you cannot compromise, you cannot modify. And he puts this in a very dramatical fashion. He says that the problem for him is to find a form of association in which each, while uniting himself with all, yet may still only obey himself alone and remain as free as before. Well, this puts the paradox in a paradoxical form. How can we, at one and the same time, unite ourselves with other people and therefore found a form of association which in some way must exercise some degree of authority, which is quite different from being entirely alone in nature, and yet not obey them. And of course, his celebrated answer, which is known the world over, given by in the work called The Social Contract, is that each man, in giving himself to all, gives himself to nobody. And that's a very dark and mysterious observation. Rousseau was a thinker who loved paradox, but his Strangeness, as a thinker, goes deeper than that. He obviously was tormented by this terrible dilemma, on neither horn of which he wished to impale himself, and then he describes in the letter the fact that suddenly he obtained a blinding solution to it. On the way, on one of his walks, in, uh, along a lake in Switzerland, the solution suddenly came upon him with a blinding flash of inspiration. He felt like a mathematician who had suddenly solved a long and torturing problem, like an artist to whom the vision was suddenly vouchsafed, like a mystic who suddenly saw the truth, the transcendental truth. He tells us how he sat down on the roadside and wept and was beside himself and how this was the central event of his entire life. And the tone in which he communicates his solution, both in the social contract and his other works, is exactly that of a man possessed by an idea of a maniac who suddenly sees a cosmic solution vouchsafed to him alone. Somebody who for the first time in history has suddenly found the answer to a problem which had tormented the whole of humanity, which previous great thinkers, perhaps Plato, perhaps Christ, had in some way enunciated, but which he and he alone had at last found in a full, rich form so that nobody need trouble to look for the solution again. He is like a geometer, who has found a solution which is not merely true, but demonstrable, which is not merely true, but proven by rules of such iron logic that nobody can ever refute it again. What is his solution? Well, he proceeds, like a mathematician, with two lines which intersect each other. He says to himself, here is liberty and here is authority, and it is difficult, it is impossible to arrange a compromise. How then are we to reconcile them? And the answer has a kind of simplicity and a kind of lunacy, which maniacal natures are often capable of. He says it isn't a question of compromise. There is a way of looking at this problem which makes it clear that they coincide, that it is possible to obtain a kind of liberty which is identical with authority. It is possible to obtain a kind of personal freedom which is the same as complete control by authority. The more free, the more authoritative. The more liberty, the more control. How is this to be achieved? The solution 
Rousseau's solution is that after all, freedom simply consists in men wanting certain things and not being prevented from having them. Well, now, what is wanting? What I always want is that which is good for me. And of course, if I don't know what is good for me, then when I get what I want, I suffer because it turns out not what I really wanted at all. Therefore, only those are free who don't merely want certain things, but who also know what, in fact, will satisfy them. Now, if a man knows what will satisfy him, then he's endowed with reason, and reason gives him the answer to the question, what should I seek for that I may be, my nature may be fully satisfied? What is true of one rational man will be true of other rational men. Just as, I suppose, in the case of the sciences, what one scientist finds to be true will be true for other scientists as well, so that if you have reached your conclusion by a proper method, from true premises, by correct rules, you may be certain that other people, if they are rational, will arrive at the same solution, or alternatively, if they arrive at some different solution, they cannot be rational. So Rousseau knows that if nature is a harmony, and this is the great premise, the great and dubious premise of the whole of 18th century thought, that if nature is a harmony, then what I truly want cannot collide with what somebody else truly wants. For if it were the case that what I want does not square with what somebody else truly wants, then two true answers to two genuine questions will be incompatible with each other. And that is impossible. That means that nature is not a harmony, that tragedy is inevitable, that conflict cannot be avoided, that somewhere at the heart of things there is something irrational, that do what I may, be, be I never so wise, whatever weapons of reason I employ, however good a man I am, however upright a man I am, and however clear-headed and reasonable and profound and wise a man I am, I may yet want something which an equally wise, equally good, equally virtuous man may wish the opposite of. And therefore, tragedy is not, after all, due to human error, stu human stupidity, and human mistakes. And that neither Rousseau nor any other 18th century thinker can really accept. Consequently, if nature is a harmony, all if anything that satisfies one rational man must be of such a nature as at any rate to be compatible with whatever satisfies other rational men. Now, Rousseau argues, all that is necessary is for men not to seek the kind of ends which conflict with the ends of others. Why do they now seek such ends? Because they are corrupt, because they are not rational, because they are not natural. And this concept of nature in Rousseau although in certain respects, like the concept of nature in other thinkers, nevertheless acquires a certain tone of its own. Rousseau is sure that he knows what it is to be a natural man, and for him to be natural is to be good. And if all men were natural, they would all be good, and what they would then seek would be something which would make each and all of them satisfied together. Let me quote from him again. As long as several men in the assembly regard themselves as a single body, they have only a single will. The constant willing of all the members of the state is the general will. The body politic is a moral being possessed of a will. It is, it, it, it is the will. This general will is something penetrates into a man's innermost being and concerns itself with his will no less than with his actions. What is this general will? Who are these men in the assembly? How is it that they generate something which can be called a, a, a single will which holds for them all? Well, Rousseau's answer is that if, just as all men who argue rationally reach the truth about m other matters of fact, and these truths are always compatible, so men in the same condition of nature, that is to say, unperverted, uncorrupted, not pulled at by selfish interests, not pulled at by regional or sexual interests, not enslaved by fear or by unworthy hopes, men not bullied, not twisted out of their proper nature by the wickedness of other men, men in that condition must want that which, if it is obtained, will be equally good for all other men as good as they are. And therefore, so long as we somehow or other regain, recapture what is to him the original innocent state of nature, in which men will not yet pray to the many passions to the many wicked and evil impulses which civilization has bred in the human breast. So if only we could recapture that, 
natural harmony, happiness and goodness would once more be the lot of human society. His notion of what is a natural man is of course something which is to some degree affected by the kind of man he was. Rousseau was a petty bourgeois from Geneva who lived in early life, the life of the camp, and who was at odds with the society of his time and was the prey of what nowadays are called psychological inferiorities of many kinds. Consequently, his notion of a natural man is the exact opposite of the kind of persons whom he particularly detested, disliked and disliked. He denounces, therefore, not merely the rich, not merely the powerful, there are few moralists who don't regard these two classes as the natural enemies of society. He denounces, and he is almost the first to denounce, a very different set of persons, and by this means deeply affected the European consciousness of the next century. He detests the arts and he detests the sciences. He dislikes every form of sophistication, every form of refinement, every form of fastidiousness. He is really the first person quite explicitly and quite openly to say that the good man is not merely simple, not merely poor, for these are sentiments which many a Christian thinker has held. He goes further than that. He thinks the rough is better than the smooth. He thinks the disturbed is better than the tranquil. Rousseau is a man who suffers from deep resentments of cliques, of coteries, of sets. He suffers from a deep resentment of intellectuals, of persons who have the pride of cleverness, of persons who in some way are experts or specialists who set themselves up over the heads of the people. All those 19th century thinkers who are violently anti-intellectual and in a sense anti-cultural, all the great militant Philistines of that century are really the natural descendants of Rousseau. Rousseau's tormented and tortured nature made him look with eyes of hatred upon people like Diderot, D'Alembert, Helvetius in Paris, who were to him fastidious, sophisticated, artificial persons, incapable of understanding all those dark emotions, all those deep and torturing feelings which ravaged the heart of a true natural man. The natural man for him was somebody who had a deep wisdom, very different from the corrupt sophistication of the towns. He is the first militant lowbrow of history. And people like Carlyle and to some extent Nietzsche, certainly Lawrence, D.H. Lawrence, and petty bourgeois dictators like Hitler and Mussolini are natural descendants of Rousseau. It's difficult to classify this as a right-wing or a left-wing phenomenon. It is mainly a kind of petty bourgeois revolt against a society from which the, the exile feels excluded, a kind of common cause with the outcasts, the rebels, the free wild artist. That is what makes Rousseau the founder of romanticism and wild individualism, as well as the founder of so many other movements in the 19th century, of socialism and communism, of authoritarianism, of democratic liberalism, of almost every single strand, except what might be called fastidious love of culture in these two centuries which followed the publication of the social contract. And because Rousseau hates intellectuals, hates persons who detach themselves from life, hates specialists, hates people who lock themselves up into, the, into some kind of special coterie, who detach themselves from life, because he feels that the heart ought to be opened, that uh, the simple peasant sitting under the ancestral oak has a deeper vision of what life is like and what nature is like and what conduct ought to be than the uh, buttoned up, priggish, fastidious, sophisticated, uh, highbrow who lives in the city, because he feels all that, he founds a tradition which then spreads over Europe, which then spreads to the United States, which is really the foundation of that celebrated concept called the American way of life, in accordance with which 
the simple people of the country possess a deeper sense of reality and a deeper virtue and a deeper understanding of moral values than the professors of the universities or the politicians of the cities or other people who have somehow become denatured, who have somehow cut themselves off from the deep inner stream which is at once life, morality, wisdom. That is the kind of impression which Rousseau communicates when he talks about nature. And although there are at least 60 senses of the word nature in the 18th century, his is, in a certain sense, unique. He goes further than anybody in, in, in identifying nature with, not merely with simplicity, but with hostility to civilized, elaborate, sophisticated, artistic, or scientific values. It isn't artists and it isn't scientists who must guide society. That is why it is like Silesius and encyclopedists so acutely. It must be the man who is in touch with the truth, and the man who is in touch with the truth is somebody who allows the divine grace, who allows the truth which nature alone possesses to pour into his heart. And this may be done only in the bosom of nature, only if you live the simple life. At first, the simple life in Rousseau is merely a description of the kind of conditions in which uh, the true answer may be vouchsafed. Gradually, it becomes that truth itself. It becomes difficult to distinguish both in Emile and the Nouvelle Eloise um, between the conditions for knowing the answer to questions and the answers themselves. For Rousseau, ultimately, it is being a certain kind of person. It is having one's heart in the right place. It's having a certain character and not possessing certain knowledge, knowing certain propositions to be true, which is the key to all the problems. In theory, he goes on like any other 18th century philosopher and says we must employ our reason, and he uses deductive reasoning, sometimes very cogent, sometimes very uh, lucid and extremely well-expressed deductive reasoning for reaching his conclusions. But really what happens is that this deductive reasoning is like a straitjacket, a straitjacket of logic which he claps upon the inner burning lunatic vision within. And it is this extraordinary combination of the inner lunatic vision with the cold, rigorous straitjacket of a kind of Calvinistic logic which really lends his prose its powerful enchantment and its hypnotic effect. You appear to be reading logical argument which distinguishes between concepts and draws conclusions in a valid manner from premises, while all the time something very violent is being said to you. A vision is being, as it were, expressed to you. Somebody is trying to dominate you by means of a very coherent, although very, uh, often very lunatic vision of life, and not really arguing in the cool and collected way in which he appears to be talking. The inner vision, as I say, is this mysterious concept of the coincidence of authority and liberty. And the coincidence derives from the fact that in order to make men at once free and capable of living with each other in society and capable of obeying the moral law, what you want is for men to want that which the moral law in fact enjoys. In short, the problem is something of this kind. You at once want to give people unlimited liberty because otherwise they cease to be men. And yet you want to, them to live according to the rules. Well, if they love the rules, then they will want the rules not because the rules are rules, but because they love them. If a man, if your problem is, how shall a man be at once free and yet in chains? Then you say, well, but if the chains are not imposed upon him, if the chains are not something with which he's bound by some external force, if the chains are something which he chooses himself because it is an expression of his nature, if the chains are something which he generates from within him as an inner ideal, if it is what he above all wants in the world, then the chains aren't chains. A man who is self-trained is not a prisoner. And so Rousseau ultimately says, man is everywhere born free, is born free, and yet he's everywhere in chains. Well, what sort of chains? If there are the chains of the convention, if there are the chains of the tyrant, if there are the chains of other people who want to use you for their own ends, then of course these are chains, and you must fight and you must struggle, and nothing must stand in the way of the great battle for individual self-assertion and freedom. But if the chains are chains of your own making, if the chains are simply the rules which you, with your own inner reason, or because of the grace which pours in while you lead the simple life, or because of the voice of conscience, or the voice of God, or the voice of nature, which are all uh, uh, referred to by Rousseau as if they were almost the same thing, if the chains are simply rules, the very obedience to which is the most freest, 
strongest, most spontaneous expression of your own inner nature, then the chains no longer bind you. Self-control is not control. Self-control is freedom. And so Rousseau gradually um, progresses towards this peculiar idea that what is wanted is men who want to be connected with each other in the way in which the state connects them. The original chains are some form of coercion which the tyrant used to employ in order to force you to do his will. And it is this which poets have been so wicked, wickedly, um, it is this which poets have so wickedly crowned with our garlands. It is this which writers have so fulsomely and so immorally tried to conceal by the encomia which they have paid to mere force, to mere authority. But what is wanted is something very really different. What is wanted, I quote Rousseau again, is the surrender of each individual with all his rights to the whole community. If you surrender yourself to the whole community, then how can you not be free? For who coerces you? Not X, not Y, not this man, not that man, not this institution, not that institution. It is the state which coerces you. But what is the state? The state is you and others such as you, all seeking your common good. And there is for Rousseau a common good. For if there were not something which is the common good of the whole society, which doesn't conflict with individual goods, if there weren't such things, then the question, how shall we live, what shall we do, what shall we, a group of men together, do, would become meaningless. And that cannot possibly be allowed. Consequently, Rousseau develops the notion of the general will. But from the notion, the harmless notion of a contract, which after all is a semi-commercial affair, which after all is merely a kind of undertaking voluntarily entered into, and I suppose ultimately revocable, by which human beings come together and agree to do certain things which will uh, lead to their common happiness, but which, if it leads to their common misery, they can, of course, abandon. From the notion of a social contract as a perfectly voluntary act on the part of individuals who remain individuals and who pursue each his own good, you gradually, in Rousseau, get the notion of the general will as almost the personified willing of a large, superpersonal entity, of something called the state, which is no longer the crushing Leviathan of Hobbes, but which is now something like a team, something like a church, some kind of unity in diversity, something which is a greater than I, something in which I think my personality only in order to find it again. It, it, there is a kind of mysterious moment at which he mystically passes from the notion of a lot of individuals in voluntary free relations to each other, each pursuing his own good, to the notion of submitting to something which is greater than myself, which is myself and yet greater than myself, the whole, the co community. The steps by which he reaches it are peculiar and worth examining for a moment. I say to myself that there are certain things which I desire, and if I'm stopped from having them, then I'm, I'm not free. And this is the worst thing which can befall me. I then say to myself, what is it that I desire? I desire the satisfaction of my nature. Well, if I'm wise and if I employ reason, then I discover in what the satisfaction lies. The true satisfaction of any one man cannot clash with the true satisfaction of any other man, for if um, it clashed, nature would not be harmonious, and one truth would collide with another, which is logically impossible. Now, uh, it may be that other men are trying to frustrate me. Why are they trying to frustrate me? If I know that I am right, if I know that what I seek is the true good, then people who oppose me must in some way be in error about what it is that they seek. No doubt they think they're seeking the good, they seek their own liberty, but they're seeking it along the wrong path. Therefore, I have a right to prevent them. In virtue of what have I right this, this right to prevent them? Not because I want something which they don't want, not because I am superior to them, not because I am stronger than they are, not even because I am wiser than they are. For they are human beings with immortal souls, and Rousseau passionately believes in equality. It is because if they knew what they wanted, they would seek what I seek. The fact that they don't know doesn't mean that they don't really know. It is the word real, which is really the treacherous word here. To, what Rousseau really wishes to convey is that every man is potentially good. Nobody can be altogether bad. If they allowed the natural goodness to well out from them, then they would want what is right. So the fact they don't want it merely means that they don't understand their own nature. But the nature is there. To say that a man, for Rousseau, to say that a man wants what is bad, although potentially he wants what is good, 
is the same as to say that in some secret part of himself, with his real self, if he were himself, if he were as he ought to be, if he were his true self, then he would seek the good. And from that, it is but a small step to saying there is a sense in which he already seeks this good, but doesn't know it. It's true that when he, if you ask him what it is he wants, he may enunciate some very evil purpose. But the true man inside him, the immortal soul, that which if only he allowed nature to penetrate his breast, if only he lived the right kind of life, he would realize what his true self, that self, seeks something else. Now, I know what that true self seeks, for it must seek what I seek, for I know that what I am now is my own true self and not my own illusory self. It is this notion of the two selves which really operates in Rousseau's thought. And therefore, when I do, when I stop him from pursuing his evil ends, even when I put him in jail in order to uh, prevent him from causing damage to other good men, even if I execute him as an abandoned criminal, I do this not for utilitarian reasons, but in order to give happiness to others, not even for attributive reasons, in order to punish him for the evil that he does. I do it because that is what his own inner, better, more real self would have done if only he had allowed it to speak. And so I set myself up as the authority, not merely over my actions, but over his. And this is what is meant by the famous phrase in Rousseau about forcing men to be free. To force a man to be free is to force him to behave in a rational manner. A man is free who gets what he wants. What he truly wants is a rational end. If he doesn't want a rational end, he doesn't truly want. If he doesn't want a rational end, what he wants is not true freedom, but false freedom. I force him to do certain things which will make him happy. He will be grateful for it to me if ever he discovers what his own true self is. That is the famous doctrine. And there is not a dictator who in years after Rousseau did not use this monstrous paradox in order to justify his behavior. From, from the Jacobins, Robespierre, Hitler, Mussolini, the communists all use this very same method of argument of saying men do not know what they truly want. By wanting it for them, by wanting it on their behalf, we really are giving them what, in some occult sense without knowing themselves, they want. In short, when I execute the criminal, when I bend human beings to my will, even when I torture them and I kill them, when I organize inquisitions, I am not merely doing something which is good for them, though that is dubious enough, I am doing that which they truly want, though they may deny it a thousand times. If they deny it, it's just because they do not know what they are, what they want, what the world is like. And therefore I speak for them, on their behalf. This is Rousseau's central doctrine. And this is the doctrine which leads to genuine servitude. And in this way, from this deification of the notion of absolute liberty, we gradually reach the notion of absolute despotism. There is no reason for human beings to have choices, to have alternatives, when only one alternative is the right alternative. Certainly they might choose it, because if they don't choose it, then they're not spontaneous, they're not free, they're not human beings. But if they don't choose it, if they choose the wrong alternative, it is because their true self is not at work. They do not know what their true self is, whereas I, who am wise, who am rational, who am the great benevolent legislator I know. And Rousseau, who had democratic instincts, lent not so much in favor, not to, so much towards individual legislators as towards assemblies, assemblies which, however, were only right to the extent to which they, um, they willed, to the extent to which they resolved to do that which um, reason inside all the members of the assembly, their true self, genuinely desired. It is for this doctrine that Rousseau lives. It is, this is the evil and the good that he did. The good in the sense that he stressed the fact that without freedom, without spontaneity, no society is worth having. That a society such as it is conceived by the utilitarians of the 18th century, in which a few experts or specialists um, organize life in a smooth and frictionless manner, so as to endow the largest number of people with as much happiness as possible, is repulsive to um, a human being who often prefers wild, unruly, spontaneous freedom, but provided it is he who acts to even the maximal happiness if that means that he is somehow worked into an artificial system, not by his own will, but by the will of some manager, of some arranger of society. The evil that Rousseau did consists in this mythology of the real self, in the name of which I can coerce people. No doubt all inquisitors and all religions 
justified their act which subsequently may have appeared to some people at any rate cruel and unjust. But at least they invoked supernatural sanctions for it. At least they invoked sanctions which reason was not allowed to question. Rousseau, who believes that this can be discovered by mere untrammeled human reason, by mere untrammeled observation of the actual nature, of actual three-dimensional nature, of, of, of nature in the sense in which it simply means objects in space, human beings, animals, and inanimate objects. Rousseau is the author of the monstrous paradox whereby liberty is a kind of slavery, whereby to want something is not to want it at all unless you want it in a certain special way, in which you can say to a man, you may think that you are free, you may think that you are happy, you may think that you want this or that, but I know better what you are, what you want, what will liberate you, and so forth. It is this monstrous paradox, according to which a man, in losing his political liberty, and in losing his economic liberty, is in some way liberated in some higher, deeper, more rational, more natural sense, which only the dictator, or only the state, or only the assembly, only the authority knows, in which the most untrammeled freedom coincides with the most rigorous and um, enslaving authority, for that paradox, Rousseau is more responsible than any thinker who ever lived. The consequence of it in the 19th and 20th century I need not enlarge upon. They're still with us now. And in that sense, it is not paradoxical to say that Rousseau, who claims to have been the most ardent and passionate lover of human liberty who ever lived, who tried to throw off every shackle, the shackle of sophistication, of culture, of convention, of science, of art, of everything, whatever, because all these things somehow impinged upon him, all these things in some way arrested his natural liberty as a man, that Rousseau, in spite of these things, was one of the most sinister and the most um, influential, uh, the most sinister and the most formidable enemies of liberty in the whole history of modern thought. <laughs>